On this edition of Native Report, with the 2010 census in the news, we learn why it's so important to Native nations across the United States. And we go behind the scenes at the 2009 NCAI Annual Convention and Trade Show, hosted by the Agua Caliente Band of Cahia Indians in Palm Springs, California. We hear from the National Congress of American Indians Youth Commission and why young people are so important to the organization. We'll also hear from the elders and learn something new about Indian Country on this edition of Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Mittawakanton Sioux Community, the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, the Blandin Foundation, and the Grotto Foundation. Welcome to the premiere episode of our fifth season of Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. For Native nations across the United States, the 2010 census is more than just counting the population. The census will determine future funding for reservation programs, such as health and human services, education, infrastructural improvements, and other government needs. In short, Indian country counts. April 1st, 2010 is National Census Day. However, an aggressive outreach effort directed toward Native communities was launched months before, in October 2009, in Palm Springs. Today at NCAI, um, the director of the Census Bureau, Dr. Robert Groves, reaffirmed a uh, bureau-wide policy recognizing the government-to-government -government relationship with federally recognized tribes. Um, not every federal agency uh, in Washington has an Indian policy yet, but uh, the Census Bureau takes it very serious. Uh, we have uh, Native people uh, working uh, all across the country now working uh, with the Census Bureau. Uh, so this agency takes the government-to-government -government relationship uh, uh, very seriously. We conduct um, uh, outreach and consultation, and we want to work with tribal governments to empower them to make it successful for them and therefore an accurate count reflects well on our mission with the United States Census Bureau. And we have a symbol that I'd like to present to you, a, a plaque that, that contains this, um, this proclamation that maybe you could hang in your office or the organization's offices. Thank you very much. <laughs> The campaign to get a true count in Indian country is important on many levels. The 2010 census is very important for Indian tribes because it directly relates to the formulas that are created for distributing over $400 billion in federal funds. And uh, many of the uh, government agencies um, uh, create the formula based on census data, so an accurate and uh, timely collection of census data is very important to Indian country as we look to the next 10 years. The purpose of the census, quite frankly, is the apportionment of our congressional uh, delegations across the country. When those congressional delegations change based on populations, um, you may add a seat. I know Oklahoma lost a seat after the 1990 census. You might be adding seats. Uh, your tribe, I mean, your representation in the Congress may have a lot to do with the kinds of monies that come to your state or to your uh, uh, to Indian country. Um, uh, uh, another example, I think, is to look at um, what tribes are doing with specific uh, data when they're doing their long-range planning. I can tell you, in Palm Springs, California, uh, with the tribes that are here um, that built casinos, a lot of their long-term uh, planning and determining whether or not a location and a population will would support that. They went to census data to do their long-range planning. So 
census may not be glamorous, but it's very important to the, um, the underpinnings of uh, tribal communities, and it's very important to the um, uh, supporting uh, tribal the growing tribal economies. But gathering statistical information, such as ages of family members and the size of households from Indian country, hasn't always been easy for a variety of reasons. It requires actually going out and physically counting people, and Indian country is a hard to count population. The remoteness, in many cases, or severe mistrust of the federal government. And so the difference between the 1990 census and the 2000 census was based on uh, an attempt to do more outreach activity, including Indian people on their advisory committee. I actually served on the Census Advisory Committee 10 years ago as a tribal leader for my tribe in Oklahoma. Now I'm working directly for the U.S. Census Bureau and uh, I'm uh, getting the word out that it is important to reduce the inaccuracies that occurred in previous decennial censuses. And the way to do that is to simply build a stronger partnership and get the tribes to own the census process in addition to owning the data. And I think that will uh, significantly reduce the undercount compared to 2000 and what's coming up. We are going out and calling on every federally recognized tribe, including all of the Alaska Native villages, and we're reaching out to them and offering a formal mechanism of a partnership, and we can empower them with information. We can hire enumerators. We can hire uh, partnership assistants from their very tribes uh, so that it is their faces that appear in their part of Indian country to get people involved in the census. Another aspect of this outreach effort is to get tribal leaders to understand the importance of owning the census and the data it generates. By participating, the outcomes will benefit their tribal communities. The partnership is extremely important. Following that, data services, which is the other part of my branch, is what we have to offer Indian country. Um, I said 10 years ago, what, what's in it for us if we get involved? And the answer is the data that comes out of it. And part of what I'm doing now is making sure that the data that is uh, coded and tabulated and produced in volumes of reports that will come in waves really over the next several years will be accurate data and that it will reflect down to what we call the block level of who is living there, how they identify themselves, and I'm even helping to create um, specific Indian data reports, kind of the shortcuts to go right to the Indian reports for our tribal people so that they can do all of their future planning. For the 564 federally recognized American Indian and Alaskan nations, the campaign launched by NCAI and the Census Bureau intends to ensure that Indian country counts. Did you know the origins of the Bureau of Indian Affairs in the U.S. government go back as far as 1775? Among the early commissioners to deal with Indian tribes were Benjamin Franklin and Patrick Henry. Until the Interior Department was created in 1849, the War Department handled Indian issues. In 1869, Ely Samuel Parker became the first commissioner of Indian Affairs who was himself an Indian. Today, the BIA continues to provide services to the 564 Indian tribes in the United States. It co-manages 87,000 square miles of land with the tribes and works with tribal governments on everything from schools to forestry to law enforcement to land and resource management and numerous other services. The BIA mainly exists because the tribe ceded lands to the United States. In exchange for these lands, the U.S. promised services to Indian tribes and their lands forever. The Charter Convention for the National Congress of American Indians was in 1944 in Washington, D.C. And since then, NCAI has met 65 times, the most recent being in Palm Springs, California. 
The annual gathering is an opportunity to hear what national issues are being addressed by Native nations, what other nations are achieving, and for individuals to network. For one week each year, the convention is the center of Indian Country activity. Indian Country's most influential leaders gathered at the National Congress of American Indians 65th Annual Convention and Trade Show hosted by the Agua Caliente Band of Cahuilla Indians. As we all know, NCAI is the oldest Native American established organization within the country. This is just the start. This is just the start, once again, of maintaining the continued run of this great organization. Ten years ago, NCAI was here in town. Here it is much stronger today. And this week, as we go through the process of elections of new officers, I know each of you within your heart and within your minds will elect those individuals which will strongly represent the NCAI organization to carry us forward for the next two years. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Richard Milanovic. I have the pleasure of serving and the honor of serving as chairman for the Albuquerque Independent Queen Indians. And on behalf of the Albuquerque Independent Queen Indians, we welcome you to Seke. Enjoy. Thank you. Joe Garcia has presided over the organization for the past four years as president. His term ended with the swearing in of new board officers on the final day of the convention. Speaking to the NCAI membership, President Garcia cited many successes and offered hope for the future. Here are just a few of the things that we have accomplished in the last four years. We have enhanced our government to government relations and educated local, state, and federal officials on our status as sovereign, independent nation. Together, we have also made public safety in Indian country one of our top priorities. NCAI has assisted in a series of congressional hearings about the public safety crisis in Indian country. And we have developed a reform agenda to make our community safer. In response to President Obama, Obama has, President Obama has recognized the importance of improving public safety in our communities. And the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs also has responded by approving the reintroduced Tribal Law and Order Act of 2009. This administration is very supportive of any country, and the President Obama pushed a true change initiative, a leader of change. He understands what we're talking about. We've all understood our needs of finding the ways by which we move forward has been the challenge. And they will see an Indian country rise to some level that it has never been to in the country, in the United States of America. And let's continue to build that, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for being, letting me be a part of your life and part of the creation of what we have accomplished throughout Indian country. Thank you. Thank you. A prominent member of President Obama's Domestic Policy Council Kimberly Teehee, Senior Policy Advisor for Native American Affairs, brought a personal message from the President. The President's commitment to Native American community is unwavering. He is committed to strengthening and building on the nation-to-nation -nation relationship, as Joe just indicated, between the United States and tribal nations. He recognizes that Native Americans suffer disproportionately from poverty high unemployment, and poor health. That more than a quarter of all American Indians live in poverty, with unemployment rates reaching 70% or higher on some reservations. That American Indians experience diseases and other causes of death at significantly higher rates than the U.S. population as a whole, including diabetes, tuberculosis, alcoholism, and suicide. The President recognizes that the United States provides health care services to American Indians and Alaska Natives as part of its federal trust responsibility to its first Americans. In addition, we've urged the agencies to 
embark on listening sessions throughout Indian country as well, or to include them in the tours that they're uh, going forward with, and to also work in an interagency and multi-agency way. And so all of these are an attempt to be more inclusive of Indian country, and to be more inclusive of your participation in these listening tours so that you can have a better seat at the table. The president is looking forward to directly hearing from the leaders of Indian country. It will not be easy for us to address the grave conditions from lack of health care, unsafe communities with high rates of violence, daunting economic barriers, to lack of educational opportunities, but this administration is committed to working together to find comprehensive and innovative approaches to address these ills. Another prominent speaker, Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs, Larry Echohawk, delivered a message from the U.S. Department of the Interior. I was at the Justice Department sitting at a table with the United States attorneys from your communities. Wherever there's a United States attorney that has significant native population, they were invited to be at this meeting. And I remember when I was uh, asked to testify on the Tribal Law and Order Act, they send written questions and I give responses before I actually show up and testify. And there was a, I wrote something about in criminal law, this is fulfilling the trust responsibility of the United States. You know the feedback I got on that? Don't say that. Trust responsibility is narrow. It like deals with lands. You know, I don't know exactly what they were thinking, but to suggest that trust responsibility might attach to criminal law enforcement seemed like a foreign concept to them. Well, they were dealing with the wrong guy because I'm a law professor. The trust responsibility of the United States when it was actually set forth in law Decisional law of the United States Supreme Court was all about criminal law. I wanted to tell them that. Believe me, I wanted to tell them that. And I will when I get that opportunity. It does apply. If we don't do our job in the Bureau of Indian Affairs, it slows everything down. Some of the opportunities that may be there that could be taken advantage of will be missed opportunities if we in the federal government cannot do our job. You know, as I assume this position is that there would be a secretary that would stand up for Indian country. And thus, thus far, it has been very, very good. It makes me even feel better when I walk into his office and almost without fail, he will walk over to me and give me a hug. I'm not a hugging guy, you know, but I appreciate that hug. And I'll tell you, for you, I will continue to hug him. This year's NCAI convention featured a number of speakers, breakout sessions, and other events for attendees to experience. The event also was a time for many to network, to renew old acquaintances, and to make new ones. A trade show also was part of the convention that featured artisans, businesses, and nonprofit organizations from across the United States showcasing their respective talents and displaying valuable information on Native issues. Yes, Ojibwe is my first language. I still speak my language, pushing the language as hard as I can, helping out at the college in the language department, because I believe that the language is the most important asset to our, to our way of life. Because, you know, our, our lifestyles have changed to electricity and cars and houses, but our way of life is still the same. We still, we still live with our value system, and that's what we've been, that's what we've been following, caring, sharing, giving people. And today it's hard because we have to learn how to, learn how, to share and how to give and how to be caring today. 
And that's where a lot of us elders come in, where we could share the, the way it was then and how we could do it today to be the people we are. Native youth from across the United States and Canada, Indian Country's Leaders of Tomorrow, were at the 2009 NCAI Annual Convention. While their agenda and issues differ from those of their elders, what they learn is vitally important to each individual and the future of their communities. With the youthful flair, the National Congress of American Indians Youth Commission opened one of their sessions with a novel way of getting to know one another. <laughs> the commission, made up of high school and college students, provides a youth perspective to NCAI and leaders across Indian country. In conjunction with NCAI and their, their general assembly, their general meetings, the actual Congress, uh, there is the Youth Commission. And the Youth Commission, is um, its purpose is to get more of the young people's voice heard, more of the engagement on their end. Uh, we get to cover issues that um, we decide or the major issues within Indian country. Right now we're working on um, teen pregnancy, juvenile delinquency, suicide. So we can cover a vast amount of issues. We get to see like how we as young people can be involved with that. Um, and I guess here we get educated and then we get to go back into our communities um, and get together with other young people, with youth groups, and see what uh, we can do back in our home communities. So uh, the Youth Commission just gets to, it's, it's youth leadership, but also at the same time, um, we get to be engaged with one another and have that networking um, opportunity as well. The Youth Commission term takes uh, two female and two male, and they're both two-year terms. Uh, this is my first year, and uh, my last year is actually in my hometown, Albuquerque. It takes uh, a lot of patience. You gotta really know what you're saying. You just really gotta know who you're talking to, and get really affiliated with everybody else. The commission promotes the enhancement of leadership skills for all Native youth, some who may one day hold a council seat on their home reservations. We are leaders now, but we are stepping into those positions as tribal leaders. So if we can have that one-to-one -one conversation with tribal leaders, we get to hear the, uh, it's a realistic, preview of the positions that we'll be stepping into. We get to hear their hearts as tribal leaders and see what, you know, the projects that they're doing, the issues that they're facing, and they get to mentor us more or less um, into the positions that we will be uh, stepping into. And it allows also the young leaders to share their heart with the older people. And it allows for more co cohesive um, relationship between the two individuals. It's a great experience as a youth commissioner. I represent all Native youth, not just one. I feel as a great example to the youth because they, they look up to you. They just uh, expect so much, out of, a lot out of you. Role models and mentors are important for these young people, and they don't have to look very far to find them. I really enjoy Joe Garcia. He, obviously, he's the NCI president right now. He, his character, he's, he's always warm and welcoming, and I like that aspect to him, but he also knows when to get down to business. And I really, really enjoy Jackie Johnson. She, um, I got to sit in on a staff meeting with them, and she was just, she was delegating, and she knew how to do it um, very so eloquently. And it was, it was really um, amazing to see the work and all the stress that she handles, and she handles it very well. Um, so two prominent leaders, they're, they're great examples of um, you know, leaders that all of the young people should kind of look to to see, for, um, to see how they, they do things with their positions. I also look up to my grandfather. Okay. And he's, he's been there for me since my 18 years, and he's been basically like a dad to me. And my mom and my dad, they, they've been really great role models too. For young people who were unable to make the NCAI gathering, Ambassador Lee encourages them to get involved in their own communities. 
I want to let them know, first of all, that they are valued. Whether they're here or not, their opinions matter, and they are valued by not only the Youth Commission, but by tribal leaders, should be valued by tribal leaders, and of all Native youth. Um, and I also would like to encourage them to get involved with their communities, um, because it takes you know one person to um, start a movement. And as long as they are being intentional about getting youth together in their community, like they can very well make that difference. They have every right and every opportunity. They just need to go out and find, you know, the, in, the people who are willing to come alongside them and serve with them. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors in Indian Country. I'm Stacy Thunder. See you next time on Native Report. Stacy Thunder is an enrolled member of and legal counsel for the Red Lake Nation. And Tad Johnson is an enrolled member of the Boys Fort Band of Ojibwe and is Solicitor General for the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Mittawakanton Sioux Community, the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, the Blandin Foundation, and the Grotto Foundation. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors in Indian Country. I'm Stacy Thunder. See you next time on Native Report. Stacy Thunder is an enrolled member of and legal counsel for the Red Lake Nation. And Tad Johnson is an enrolled member of the Boys Fort Band of Ojibwe and is Solicitor General for the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Mittawakanton Sioux Community, the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, the Blandin Foundation, and the Grotto Foundation. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Mittawakanton Sioux Community, the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, the Blandin Foundation, and the Grotto Foundation.